Well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us for another Calm COVID Combo, number six in the series. So we're getting through all the topics, the idea being to take all the stress, hype and drama out of any of these COVID conversations that we're, happening, that we're having out there. Um, each one's got a different topic. Um, and today we're going to be talking about commercial tenancies and in particular, the recently released mandatory code of conduct for landlords and tenants to abide by. Um, there's some real interesting sort of things to consider in there. So I'll be looking forward to, to diving into that. For those of you who don't know me, my name is John Knight. I'm the Managing Director and Founder here at Business Depot. Chartered Accountant, bean counter by trade, um, but more and more these days spending my time on strategy and business planning, which of course we can still do remotely with you during these times. On each of my Calm COVID convos with me is my partner in crime, Rebecca Mahalik from our Business Depot Sydney office head of also of our national offering around tech advisory. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks, John. And also joining us today, we have Rob Shepley. Rob is the one of the directors at Business Depot Legal, um, specializes in the commercial legal matters. So all things commercial from a legal perspective, from buying and selling businesses, shareholders agreements, IP protection, and of course, commercial property transactions. Welcome, Rob. Thanks, John. So today we're diving into this mandatory code of conduct and what are the implications for the landlord? What are the implications for the tenant? So we really want to make sure we're looking at this today from both lens, both the lens of the landlord and the lens of the tenant. Now, Rebecca, you're out there hearing from clients all day, every day about what's going on. Um, and you're getting asked heaps of questions. Are, is this something that's on the mind of, of either landlords and tenants? Absolutely. It's on everybody's mind. And even before the code of conduct came out, we were having conversations with um, our clients who are tenants wanting to know what their options are. But quite specifically in the last week, they've been calling up or emailing and wanting to know that now that this code of conduct has passed, does it mean that their landlords have to give them a discount now? Well, it's one of the big three costs, isn't it? I think when we had Bradley Conn on the other day, he talked about the big three costs. When we talked about cost cutting, wages, rents, and banks. Yeah. So now that we've got some, some confidence around JobKeeper payments, or we've got some more information around JobKeeper payments, obviously rents now are coming up. What are the things that they're asking you about though, Rebecca? They just want to know- Is it just the application of the code or are they getting more specific? They're getting quite specific um, around how much do they have to give me as a discount? How do we calculate it? And what information do I need to give? Are probably the key questions. But I think what, really unclear to everybody is whether or not now landlords are legally required to actually give a discount. So Rob, what yeah. is the legal position of this code of conduct? What are the legalities around it even? Yeah, well, that's one of the things that's, um, I think, that's uh, quite unclear in the community. Uh, and the reality is right now, it's actually not law. So it's, the, it's a code of conduct that's been issued by that national cabinet but it still needs to be legislated in each individual state and territory. So um, we anticipate that when it does get legislated, that it may be retrospective. So it, it may be sort of backdated, so to speak, to when it was issued in sort of earlier this month. Um, but that's really a reason why there's a lot of ambiguity on a lot of these points is that because it's sort of like a statement of intent. So it's a pretty good indication of what the law will be but right now it's actually not law yet. What would you say to a client, either, either a tenant or a landlord then? I mean, should they be complying with the code to, to the letter of the code at this point or should they be waiting for legislation? What are you saying? Yeah. To people? Well, look, even, even the code, the way it's written, it, it's talking about a negotiation between landlord and tenant. So that's already been happening you know, over the last few weeks without this code between landlords and tenants. Um, the, the issue now is that um, it's a little bit dangerous potentially to strike deals now without the full picture of what the, the law is going to be when it gets implemented. <clears throat> so the, you know, and the issues are around what, what are the not negotiables in here and what are the parts to be negotiated. So I, I think the discussions still need to happen. And so tenants who uh, feel they need, um, you know, arrangements on rent should still be having discussions with landlords, but that, um, 
ideally, it, to the extent you can, um, not to, well, you either make a commitment now and express it in a way to say, well, this overrides anything that's in the code, uh, or if you can hold off for a little bit in terms of formalising the arrangement, that's probably not a bad idea and so that everyone knows um, how the law actually gets implemented. So would it maybe make sense to just put sort of short, shorter term sort of arrangements in place at the moment, yep. sort of subject to final legislation? That's right. And look, even if, even if this was law right now, there's no requirement, like people often are looking at this saying, well, look, I had a reduction in my turnover, so I want this blanket rent cut, uh, cut for, you know, six month period. The reality is it doesn't need to be like that. So it can be something that is determined on a, a shorter basis. So I think if, if um, relief's needed now, it, there's nothing wrong with having an arrangement for, say, April, and then maybe one for May, and then just reviewing it as you go. It doesn't need to be something that's locked in for a big, long period. Well, we've got so much uncertainty at the moment, don't we? You know, none of us, whether you're a landlord or a tenant, you don't really want to be locked into something that may not be in your best interest for, for, for long term. By the way, if anyone does have any questions, please use the Q&A down the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll collate your questions on there and we'll be answering those as we go as well. So, so Rob, give us the, the headline sort of items. What, what, what essentially is the code? Um, what obligations is the code putting on landlords and tenants? Yeah, so one of the, the, the key things here is that the code links a reduction in turnover, so revenue, to a, a, a rent concession. So then there's examples used in the code. So you talk about a tenant's business who's had a say 60% reduction in turnover. And it's not really specific on what period we're comparing it to, but if we, if we sort of consider what they've talked about with JobKeeper, sort of talking about potentially the, the previous April, for example. So what the, what the code is saying is that if you've had a 60% reduction in turnover, then there should be a 60% rent concession given by the landlord. And of that 60%, at least half of it has to be a rent waiver. So the other half, so the other 30% could be deferred rent to be repaid later on. Okay, so the rule of thumb is they're linking it back to, to turnover essentially, are they? That's right, yeah, so it's a direct link to um, reduction in turnover. So Rebecca, I know you've got a lot of clients in hospitality and, and fitness and those types of things. Some of those guys have been completely closed down. Does that mean, Rob, that there's a potential no rent for a period of time with half of it being completely waived and the other half being deferred? Yes, that's, that's certainly what it, what it looks like at the moment. So if there's a 100% reduction in turnover, then there's a 100% rent concession of which at least 50% needs to be a waiver. So um, there's also fairly strong language in there suggesting that in situations where the tenant is completely unable to trade, that landlords should provide more than 50% as a waiver. So I think the government has been sort of careful not to uh, push this too hard because you know, you've got a lot of different types of landlords who own commercial property, ranging from, you know, big funds, big corporates, down to mum and dad investors. Um, but the, the minimum requirement is that 50% rent waiver. And, and that would mean that if, if a tenant's business was shut for six months and generated no revenue for six months, then the landlord would get, would get no income for that six month period and then only recover, you know, three months of it um, later on through the deferred rent. Now, I mean, knowing that we've got on this webinar, we've got landlords as much as we do have tenants on here. And that, some of those landlords are, are self-funded retirees that are relying on, on that income as well. How does this link in to some of the bank assistance packages and land tax concessions and those types of things, do you know? Well, so there is also with things like because obviously with a, with a lease, you've got the rent and then there's outgoing. So all we've been talking about is really around the rent. <clears throat> so we also need to pass through any, because there are concessions on land tax and so forth, which has been proposed by some governments. So the landlord has to pass that on. There's also mention in the code around the landlord also needs to pass on any other sort of support it gets. And it does mention banks there. 
but the the problematic thing with landlords is you know probably at best they're getting potentially a deferral of payments to their bank but not a waiver of interest so it, it's it's not it's really not a back-to-back arrangement so it's pretty problematic I think. yeah so even if that landlord's getting a, a deferral of their of their repayments they're now essentially being required to provide a waiver of their income up to 50%. Yeah, that's right. It could be very serious for some of those self-funded retirees out there that rely on these, these rents and things that, that, that come in. Rebecca, I think we've got a, a question on there already. Uh, we've actually got a few questions. Um, there's a question in here about whether or not we know if when the states are actually going to start legislating the code. Um, I don't believe they've come out with firm dates yet, have they, Rob? No, no, it's all, um, all the, all the websites and the parliamentary sort of records don't show anything yet as to a date. I think because there's so much going on, um, you know, they're just trying to implement, of course, obviously the job keeper and so forth at Commonwealth level. So, um, we really don't know, but we, we do have, it sort of indicates that's most likely to be, um, backdated to be effective from that, that three April mark. I mean, Queensland government's only just come out with their land tax um, concession. I think it was 25% off the top of my head um, with their land tax concession only recently. So it's pretty hard to have a full picture even to legislate this code if we don't have the full picture on all the concessions either. Yeah, that's right. That, and that's why um, at this stage, it's a little bit, um, it, it's difficult for landlord or tenant to get clarity on what, um, like on what sort of arrangements they can come up with. Um, because, you know, Are there any other key obligations on the landlord then, Rob? So that's obviously a big one. Yep. What are the other key obligations on the landlord? So the, well, the landlord is um, not permitted during this pandemic period, which we, again, that pandemic period sort of term is used a lot. And the reality is we don't know how long it's going to be yet. But if we sort of think about six months or so, um, that might be indicative. So... For that period, landlords um, aren't allowed to evict tenants for non-payment of rent. Um, so where that's unclear is, you know, is it okay for a landlord to evict a tenant for other reasons or for unpaid rent prior to this pandemic? Mm. So issues like that, I anticipate, will be made once it gets legislated very clear. So um, that, that's what if, what if someone's that. already been issued with, say, a, a notified a remedy of breach for... for for something prior to this so-called pandemic period? Well, look, I think you just have to look at it from a pragmatic point of view. So um, if there's history, I think, of the tenant, you know, persistently being default of long before this pandemic started, which is part of the issue around we don't really have fixed dates saying that exactly, because it's all talking about the impact on the tenant as a result of coronavirus. And that sort of started, you know, unclear exactly where, where it started or where it's gonna end. So I think if um, landlords still need to look at pragmatically and not be, um, not be deterred to take action to, against tenants who are doing the wrong thing, who have done the wrong thing in the past, um, you just gotta make sure you do it carefully in this environment, just to make sure that you're not um, tripping yourselves up on something later. But I'd be very, I'd be very unlikely that when it gets legislated, that a, a landlord is unable to get rid of a tenant who was previously in default or is in default for other reasons. And again, until we have the legislation, we don't truly really know. That's right. Any other key obligations on the landlord? So the uh, all rent reviews are frozen as well for the moment. Um, there's an obligation on with this deferred rent we talked about where half of that rent concession could be deferred. Um, that has to be re repaid over a minimum 24 month period for tenants. So the landlord has to give them that long, quite a long period to actually repay that rent. Uh, it's unclear whether you can have um, landlord can charge interest on that deferral. You certainly can't charge interest on the waiver component, but potentially on the deferral um, amount. Um, and so landlords also can't call on any security. So you can't call on a bank guarantee or a security bond. So again, at the moment, it's sort of blanket, uh, the rule in, this, um, in, these, in these principles just says you can't call on them. I anticipate when it gets legislated, it's more gonna be linked to, well, you can't call on it in 
relation to unpaid rent during the coronavirus period. But if the tenants breach the lease in another way, um, I anticipate landlords will be able to call on it still. But that's, again, one of the uncertainties right now. And just to hone in on that comment about the rent reviews, is that market reviews only that you're not allowed? Well, to it's, all, it's all rent reviews at the moment. So no CPI increases or anything like that? Yeah, it's just it's just rents are frozen effectively. So um, like, because that could be fairly problematic too. So we'll see how that all gets. Because once the period lifts, you know, does that mean you then go back and work we out the rent review it. from when it lifts or do you backdate it or it's a little bit... The devil's in the detail with that. And if you've got a lease that ends in 12 months' time, I think you said there that you can you can recover the deferred amount over a minimum 24 months, I think it was. If your yeah. lease doesn't even go for 24 months, what do you think might happen in that situation? Well, there's two options. So um, one is that um, the tenant may ask to extend the term of the lease. So there's, there's some... One of the points in the, um, uh, in the um, Code of Conduct says that tenants should be given an opportunity to extend the lease. So it's, it says sort of should, not must. So again, it, it's not clear exactly what the intent will be, but it appears that um, a landlord may have to at least consider a request for the tenant to say, have another 12 months on the lease. Um, okay. Or if, um, if that doesn't work or if a tenant doesn't want that, then it would be a situation where the tenant might have an obligation to repay that rent for 12 months after their lease finishes. And then that can get a little bit difficult regarding security and so forth because, you know, there's potentially a new tenant in there at that point in time. And if there's a bond or something, you, you'd feel a bit, the well, landlord's not going to be keen on handing back a bond yeah. uh, to a tenant when there's, you know, unpaid rent still yeah. sitting there. Rebecca, how do you feel about that from, from probably from a tenant's perspective, this idea of just pushing it down the road? Oh, well, not so much from a tenant perspective, from an accountant perspective. I, I've always got that thought about deferral is really just that. It's a deferral. It doesn't go away. And there's a lot of implications about that. But if your business is suffering right now and deferral helps you get through the next six months until trading lifts, then, then that's a fantastic option for a tenant. Um, not so fantastic sometimes the landlords, depending on mm. what the circumstances are, the waiver will be difficult for them and the deferral, at least they'll get the funds. But um, in regards to that um, and all these other obligations the landlords may possibly have under the code of conduct once it becomes legislated, um, you know, are there things that they should, should the landlords just proactively be going out there and getting in contact with their banks if they're mortgages or looking at their other options right now to protect themselves and their position, sort of similar to what we talked about with our small business clients and analysing their cash flow. I think it's the landlords really need to start to get on board with that now. Wouldn't you agree, John? Absolutely. Well, I'm a bit worried because we've got a lot we're pushing down the road here at the moment. You know, we're, we're pushing our, our loan repayments down the road. We're pushing tax down the road, payroll tax. And now we've, we've, we've got in here as well, potentially pushing rents down the road. And when we think about some of these businesses that have been so catastrophically impacted by COVID and, and what's going on at the moment, some of them are on pretty skinny profits at the best of times. Um, and I don't quite know how they're going to be able to repay these old debts that are accumulating during this time. So, so what happens in that situation, Rob? What if they end up going broke? What if the tenant ends up going broke anyway? Well, that, that's certainly the risk um, is that, and look, even without this code, that was obviously a very real risk, which is why a lot of landlords and tenants were proactive on this point. Um, but currently there's no guidance in there on, you think that in that situation, if the tenant actually goes bust, going, it's going insolvent, then um, the security and you know, the bank guarantee and so forth needs to be somehow dealt with in there. Um, so it should, I anticipate that it should be as per normal where a tenant goes bust, um, they go into administration or something, the landlord can get to a point where the, the lease can be ended. Um, I just sort of query if um, how many tenants, because there's also been sort of separately that announcement around the insolvent trading type legislation and so forth has been sort of, I suppose, watered down a little bit for this period. Uh, because mm. the reality is a lot of businesses will be insolvent trading. 
So I'm not sure how much in practical terms that'll impact on people who might otherwise have pulled the trigger on appointing mm. a straighter, whether they might just not bother um, or whether that will uh, increase or not. A little bit I suppose we don't, we don't know what the rental market's going to be like when we come out the other side of this, do we? And at least this way we're trying to keep a tenant in our property from a landlord perspective for the other side of this, which is obviously the, the intention. Um, but who knows what happens on the on on the way through for for some of these guys who are already struggling. We've talked about the landlord obligations. Obviously, there must be some obligations on the tenant as well. That's right. So the the tenants, you know, under this code, this um, the mandatory type provisions are only intended to apply to tenants who are actually suffering as a result of coronavirus. So there are types of businesses that are doing really well at the moment. And there are some that are you know, hugely impacted, you know, things like gyms and so forth closing the doors. And there's others that don't really know where it's going to be yet. So from a tenant's point of view, you need to look at it um, and understand that just because this code is out there and it talks about uh, big rent concessions, um, whether it applies to you or not depends on whether you actually fall within the criteria. So the, the criteria is, you know, again, it's not entirely clear just yet, um, but it's talking about linking it to um, eligibility for JobKeeper. So if a, a tenant's business was eligible for JobKeeper. Which is a 30% decline in turnover. That's right, a 30% decline, um, then they would be eligible under here as well. Okay, um, so that sort of automatically makes them eligible for this code to be applicable. That's right, but the, the other part that I think tenants need to be mindful of is um, because different businesses are impacted differently, the landlords are gonna be asking for financial information just to substantiate the position. It's obviously a little bit easier with some businesses if the business has had to shut its doors uh, because they've been ordered to do so, that might be more black and white. Um, but I think tenants probably need to be not too, um, you know, not too precious on disclosing reasonable information to landlords to help them make these decisions. Because until an agreement is reached, the tenant does need to comply with the lease um, as it's written. And if you think about a, even if a, a rental concession is given, if it's a, say it's a 70% concession, quite significant, then the tenant still needs to be paying the 30%. So uh, the code talks about tenants will waive their rights under the code if they don't comply. So tenants do need to be very careful that if they strike a deal and get a concession, they need to uphold their end of the bargain still um, because if potentially if they don't, then they might end up um, losing all those concessions. And the if I get this right yeah. though, though, Rob, they, they, they can't be kicked out though because of that. Is that well, right? But it does talk about it. There, there is part of the code says that um, if the tenant, a tenant can lose the protection under this code if they don't comply with the lease. So again, okay. it's not you know really very written very clearly yet, but I anticipate that'll mean that tenants who do the wrong thing, who are under here get a discount, but then don't pay the the remainder amount, um, they're actually potentially going to waive their whole entitlement under this code. So that could allow a landlord to evict the tenant, because the intent behind here is that the 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 rent that's not the rent arrears the tenant is protected from being evicted for, um, but only where it's actually a concession that's been agreed and it's under this code. So if it's a 70% reduction, tenant needs to pay the 30. Tenant doesn't pay the 30. It appears that that could mean they forfeit all of the protections. Okay. So Rebecca, um, Rob shared there that, you know, landlords, correct me if I'm wrong, Rob, have a, an entitlement to ask for say financial statements and things like that, is that right? Well, it's, it's not specific on financial statements. It's actually really vague the way it's written. It says, you know, what is sufficient accounting information is, or sufficient and accurate information to be shared. Says this includes information generated from an accounting system. So it's really not specific. How do you feel about that, Rebecca? Um, landlords asking all your clients to provide evidence of, of, their, of their financial or their turnover, at least. I, well, I think that the turnover, given the way that the code is written and the... Um, the requirements for there to be a drop in turnover and that to line up 
with the reduction in rent, that it's reasonable to have to give information around turnover, but the level of information that some landlords are asking tenants beyond that item is in, can be seen as being a bit invasive and whether or not it's actually useful information to the actual landlord or relevant. So there needs to be that, you know, that weighing up of what does the landlord actually need to know and um, what is the code of conduct actually requiring them to provide? And my understanding at this stage is it's mainly going to be around revenue. Yeah, well, that's the code seems to be linked to revenue, and revenue is obviously a key requirement for for job keeper payment as well. So, tell me how you feel about this, Rebecca. I know I saw a um a letter from a from a commercial agent, and one of the conditions was the tenant had to provide financial statements um, certified true and correct by an accountant um, for the tenant. How do you feel about that as an accountant, Rebecca? A little bit furious, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, for the for the listeners, why accountants freak out about that is this idea of being certified true and correct. That goes down the terminology of an audit. Now, you don't want these financial statements audited because that brings a whole other range of obligations for us as accountants and the costs that go along with that and everything. So maybe that idea of limiting it to, to turnover and maybe getting a accountant's letter or something or rather to confirm turnover or, or something along those lines might work. And let's be quite serious here as well. If like the drops in revenue we're talking about, they're not little drops, they're not five and 10%, these are substantial drops. And if the landlord understands generally the industry that that business is in, there's going to have to be a common sense acknowledgement that there is being a genuine drop in revenue. If it's a cafe, if it's a gym, if it's you know a, a business that services an industry that's suffering, if it's recruitment, these things that aren't really getting a lot of traction at the moment, there has to be a common sense acknowledgement by the landlord that yes, it's probably ac accurate that there is a drop in revenue. Mm. Well, I think one, one thing where it comes in too is, certainly when we're talking about the standard mechanism here around you know, linking the reduction to the turnover, which it does, um, oh, I agree like you know, providing full financials with balance sheet and so forth isn't relevant for that exercise. Where it, it may be relevant is if, you know, if the code encourages landlords to provide a higher waiver than 50%, you know, where the circumstances you know, make it appropriate. So I think if a tenant was arguing for more than 50%, then they would, they might want to disclose more and sort of, you know, but that, that's a, so a tenant could make that choice, I think, at that point in time. But I think if landlords are sort of offering fairly significant concessions, um, tenants might want to, just balance the interests of, you know, giving the landlord comfort versus obviously not disclosing too much. Yeah, I mean, well, ScoMo used that terminology very early on about everyone has to wear a bit in this in this crisis, this economic sort of crisis. Um, and, and I suppose what this code is doing is it's saying the landlords have to wear a bit. So I suppose what we don't want is don't want tenants then turning around, trying to take advantage of a situation if you haven't quite, um, if, if you're trying to push that drop, um, a bit further than the reality, um, which makes us revert back to that fair and reasonable sort of way of thinking about things, doesn't it? Yeah. Are there any other obligations on the tenants as part of the code, Rob? Well, so the the tenant obligations really there are around um, otherwise complying with the lease. So it's not to negotiate fairly and reasonably and so forth under the under the code. Um, do, they, so, do we still get to on charge things like land tax and, and those types of things? Do they still have to have that paid throughout yeah, the period? Okay. So it doesn't really talk about outgoings. So I think the implication is outgoings need to be paid as normal. Um, but if landlords get a concession from land tax, they need to then on charge that. Um, a couple of areas that are problematic potentially from a tenant point of view is if a tenant has sublet the premises as to how that works. Because um, I could see a situation where a the tenant might qualify potentially for these concessions and maybe the sub-tenant doesn't. Does that mean yeah. the tenant collects on one end 100% and then doesn't pay 100%? So there's a few things like that that are a bit tricky. Um, I think if there's a gross lease where the rent includes outgoings, um, it's sort of, that's a bit unclear as to how that would work at this stage. So with outgoings, then you'd, you'd, you'd I suppose, advise a, a landlord at the moment to continue to send them on to, to a tenant? Yeah, definitely. So I think until you come to 
until there's an agreement reached between landlord and tenant on any concessions that might apply, um, the tenant definitely needs to perform the lease in the normal way and the landlord should be expecting the tenant will do that as well. And I, I think the, the point too is that it, it doesn't need to be, as I mentioned before, you don't have to lock in a concession for an extended period of time. Like you can actually be reviewing it regularly. It could be structured where it says, we'll actually look at your revenue um, month by month and then have a, a floating type concession or something like that. Because one of these things where some businesses might be like the tap turns off and then it turns back on again later. Um, others, it might be much more gradual. Yeah, I must say that as an accountant, that worries me somewhat that we're using a purely a turnover metric here because you know many businesses have a certain amount of fixed costs and yeah. once the turnover gets below that that break even point they're in a negative position anyway um but i understand they had to have a simple metric to um to apply to this rebecca we got some questions on there to be answered we do um there is a question here about whether or not uh, these arrangements between the tenants and the landlords need to be an amendment to the lease or would just an email suffice how would you suggest it actually um, occurs so it's binding effectively? Yeah, so <laughs> I think up until now, a lot of landlords have been fairly relaxed in how this has been done. It might have been issued by way of a letter or an email to a tenant. Um, particularly here, um, in this situation, I'd advise it needs to be something that's in writing. It could still be in the form of a letter, but it needs to be properly signed by landlord and tenant. And it needs to also refer to this like if, if if it's necessary to enter into some concession commitment now then it it should mention in there that it is intended to sort of waive all rights under the code like it needs to be written in a way that you know because you don't want a situation where a landlord and tenant do a deal um and then the tenant then this gets you know some new rules come out in two weeks time and then all of a sudden the tenant puts their hand up for something else uh, or vice versa with the landlord so it sort of does need to be written properly. So it is an area where you know, legal advice is quite important here to make sure that if you're intending to have a binding arrangement, that it's actually binding. So I would think, think that... Sorry, Rob. I was just going to say, I think that emails are, are really not ideal for this type of arrangement. It should be sort of people signing a document. Well, both, both sides really want to make sure that they've got a, a, an agreed commitment and agreed understanding. Do you, do you see it as like a one pager that will adjust terms of a lease or something like that? Yeah. So I think for, for landlords that have got multiple uh, premises that as part of this exercise, they'll it make sense for them to develop a pro forma sort of rent concession type document, which could only be like a probably a two pager document. And then it gets populated each time. So it doesn't need to be a, a really big formal document, but it just needs to cover, um, I suppose, all of the the relevant implications with this. You don't sort of want to deal with one issue there. Like you, you don't want to deal with and say, we'll defer rent this amount and then not deal with when it's going to be repaid. So you sort of need to make sure you capture all the, all the details. Yeah, good. Come on, Rebecca? Just some more questions around sort of these agreements that people are putting in place uh, or will be putting in place. Um, does the code cover anything around um, a reduction in rent and then an ex and then a following extension of the lease agreement and whether or not if the, the landlord can press that as an issue or sort of force a tenant into accept it, uh, to taking a rent reduction, but as a result, they have to extend their lease? Well, the... The whole arrangement of the code talks about getting to a mutual position, but there's some parameters around that where, you know, the landlord, as we said, half of the reduction has to be a, a waiver. So there, there's some limitations on that. So it, there's nothing stopping a landlord and tenant from agreeing to um, extend the lease in that type of situation. Um, but it's unlikely a situation where the landlord could sort of unilaterally force that because it's, so if the tenant agreed to it and then the you know, landlord makes other concessions, then that can certainly happen. But it's, it doesn't sort of allow the landlord at this stage to just unilaterally you know, extend the lease. Yeah. Okay, so it good. might be a case if the landlord, for example, gave extra generous terms on the reduction or the waiver, then, then the corresponding give on that end from the tenant is that they have to sign a longer lease. 
That's right. Yeah. So if the, I think if a landlord's providing you something above um, the sort of minimum concessions under here, then yeah, absolutely. That would make sense that um, a condition of those extra benefits would be extension to the lease. Uh, it might be a different situation if the landlord's only doing the bare minimum and wants to um, extend the lease as well. So I think it needs to be considered on a case by case basis, but there's no automatic extension of the lease for a landlord. There's a question on here from Heather and a similar one from, from Tegan around what if the tenant just chooses to close, i.e. they're not necessarily forced to close by the government or anything like that, but they, they're choosing for whatever reason. Does the, the code sort of differentiate? Well, the code talks about a hardship and financial distress. So if it's a, if it's something that's manufactured, like a tenant sort of manufactured, you sort of go, well, that's probably not really a hardship or financial distress situation. Um, but the reality is here, there's a lot of gray here because there's some businesses where maybe they're not, they could be still trading, but you know, it just doesn't make sense for them to keep the doors open if there's no one there. So that there's a lot of gray here. Um, it's all the social distancing sort of requirements and so forth in there, if you, if you think about it in an office situation. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So um, yeah, there, there's a lot of gray in there. Um, hard to get definitive on that point but i don't think that i think a, a tenant it shouldn't just apply to a tenant who is forced to shut their doors um you know, it will also apply to other situations where the tenants made the decision to do it but it needs to be in that context of this is a hardship type application do you think there could be like a, a like a reconciliation at the end of a period around this? Like, do you, does the landlord maybe give a, I don't know, a 50% reduction for a period of time with an agreement to reconcile it back to an actual drop of revenue um, after we've, we've got the true, the actual results? Yeah, I think that, that could definitely happen. Um, what we've seen a lot of at this stage has been simple type concessions saying, well, look, we'll give you X percent um, you know, rent waiver or, you know, X months rent free or whatever deferral, whatever it is. So a lot at this stage, this stage has been fairly simple. And I think part of that is because we just don't know how long it's going to last for. Yeah. But it may well make very good sense to, you know, if, if people are talking about being much later in the year before things actually really return to normal, something more complicated, um, like what you mentioned might actually really be more fair in the situation. So, it could be right now that people agree on something simple, but then look to revisit it in a month or two and then come up with something a bit more tailored okay. to that particular tenant's business. What else we got on the questions, Rebecca? Just, um, you mentioned when we were talking about businesses that had to shut, those businesses that are office, um, just an office suite and although the business itself hasn't had to shut, effectively there's no tenants. Um, because everyone's working from home. Now, this yeah. business may not have had any real drop in income or a significant drop in income. However, they're effectively not using the space. I imagine that they wouldn't have a lot of grounds to ask for a reduction in their rent just because they're not using the space at the moment. That's right, yeah. So I think if um, they're not using the space and there are people able to work from home, which is really a lot of those office type businesses, um, then if they haven't had the actual drop, in revenue, then um, then they shouldn't be coming under this code. Yeah, I, I, I'm anticipating a real change in that office rental space moving forward once we get get past this and people have gotten a little bit more comfortable with managing their teams working from home. I just wonder yeah. what that environment's going to look like and will we all go and get yeah. one for every staff member moving forward? Well, I mean, as we've talked about before, Rebecca, you know, we anticipate that people will never work the same again. Um, in which case, you know, these Zoom meetings and so forth are, are, are being very effective at the moment. And so what's it mean for the commercial space down the track? Who knows? Okay, Rebecca, have we got any more questions on there? Yeah, we have quite a few actually. Um, so we've got in here, I think we may have touched on this already, but what happens if a lease is up before the 24 months and how does then the, the landlord protect themselves or the tenant ensure that the rent that's been deferred gets repaid. Yeah, so the, the code talks about, land, it says landlords should um, extend the lease for tenants. So I think in that situation of there's 12 months left in the term, 
um, and then you know the tenant needs to repay over that 24 month period that it may be that landlord and tenant agree to extend the lease for 12 months um, which sort of creates a little bit of security in that the tenants in possession and they're repaying they're paying normal rent plus the back rent um, but in terms of if, if a term ends and is still outgoing um, out, uh, sorry outstanding rent then in my mind it needs to be that the security bond has a part to play there um, it just would make no sense for a landlord to return a bond when there's still money owing, which you'd never do normally under the lease. So we just need to see how that actually gets legislated. Uh, I anticipate it'll get watered down a little bit to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's a situation where I think if, um, if there is not much of the term left and the tenant doesn't intend and the landlord doesn't intend to have the tenant in there for a, a long enough period to repay. They do need to be talking about security to repay that deferred rent, uh, whether it's, you know, personal guarantee, you know, charge over assets. There's a few options available. It definitely needs to be thought about. Speaking of um, the security deposit, which you mentioned, is the security deposit something that could be looked at now as part of the negotiation to dip into to um, for a business to cover part of the um, rent reduction? Yeah, so um, it does talk about in the code that the landlord tenant can agree to sort of, it appears you can opt out of the code by mutual agreement. So potentially the landlord and tenant could say, well, look, I've got a six month um, cash bond. Why don't we use that in this negotiation so the landlord can take it now or part of it later? So I think that is going to be an option. Um, but it's it's not something where the landlord can just immediately go, well, look, rather than give you a rent deferral, I'll just take it off the security bond, which I think would have been made perfect sense prior to this code, um, but they've put in uh, that sort of restriction on landlords unilaterally doing it at this stage. Yeah. Margie's got a question on there just asking about where's the details of the land tax concessions, specifically in Queensland. All that we've summarised all the concessions announced by all the states now um, on our website under the blog tab. And if you just go into the main COVID updates blog down the bottom of there, you've got a link to all the other states and everything. Queensland in particular, they've um, announced reducing land tax liabilities by 25% for the 2019-2020 assessment year. And they've given some three months deferrals on payments um, as well. But if you go on there you can, on the blog, you'll see most information on there. Um, for each of the well, states. It's also a 25% reduction and a few other options on there as well. Yeah, I don't think Victoria's come out with anything yet though. Not yet, I don't believe. On land tax, yeah. Melissa's asked, what if the tenant ha does not have a formal lease and is renting under a handshake agreement? I think they're probably buggered, aren't they, Rob? Well, look, yeah, that's, that's a tricky situation because a month, like about informal lease is typically a month to month type lease. Um, so that, that's something which I'm certain will get dealt with when it gets legislated. Um, but I would anticipate that the tenant's not in a great position um, right now. And I think from a landlord's point of view, in that situation, you'd be thinking about, well, um, if this tenant, if I get this tenant out now, what else can I use this space for? And potentially the landlord might have another option, something else he can do with it. Or yeah. it might be a landlord might want to keep the tenant in there. So yeah. I think it's on a case by case. What's well, that fair and reasonable sort of everyone has to play their bit in there, doesn't it? Ryan's asked about the sublease arrangement again. Um, um, regardless of the leaseholder's position, are we able to take advantage of the waiver and deferred rental payments? And I think you answered that before by saying we just don't know exactly how it will apply to subtenants. Is that right, Rob? That's right. Now, I think that will be dealt with when it gets legislated because. Um, and look, it may well be that um, what it is is that the the premises get sort of analysed, you know, because you've got two occupiers, right? Like if you've got the tenant and a subtenant, then potentially you have to consider the turnover drop for both um, businesses and how that sort of correlates mm -hmm. to the overall rent. So that, that would be a fair approach is actually considering it on that sort of basis. So I anticipate something will come out in legislation on that front to you know, make sure that you know, it's not getting abused and to make sure that tenants, sub-tenants um, aren't sort of prejudiced by this arrangement. Absolutely. 
Rebecca, any other questions on there? I've got a question here that's come up a few times during this series, but in different formats around insurance and that insurance companies are you know, not covering business interruption or landlords because of COVID-19. Um, uh, I don't really think there's going to be any change on that. Anything that's happening at the moment, unfortunately, doesn't seem to be a claimable event against any insurance policy. Is that both of your understandings as well? Yeah, I think that's right. So um, yeah, insurance um, policies always have exclusions and things in there. And it, it sounds like pandemics appear to be a fairly common exclusion. So even though it's an entirely genuine situation, um, it, it, my understanding is a lot of insurance isn't available at the moment. I just got a question on here. Um, he issued a tenant with two notices to remedy breach of covenant due to their arrears for February and March. This breach has not been remedied and I'm about to take action by way of a lockout. Landlord has advised to follow through with the lockout. Am I still within my legal grounds to action this lockout? Well, this is where this, um, whether the law is retrospective or not, um, when it comes in is is sort of the, the tricky issue here. And, you know, because currently this, you know, this whole document is written as like a, you know, a heads of agreement type thing. So it's not written very clearly or specifically. When it's talking about the restriction on landlords terminating, it's talking about landlord must not terminate at least due to non-payment of rent during the pandemic period or reasonable recovery period. So um, reading that, would mean that if there's been a prior um, breach of non-payment of rent for a prior period, that uh, that would indicate that you could still evict a tenant in the ordinary way. Where it's problematic is if you've got breaches that cover both periods um, and then exactly when that period starts as well. So I think landlords should still be um, try to follow things in, in the usual course, but um, I suppose be I suppose more more vigilant than normal, perhaps on making sure you you know you dot all the I's and cross the T's. Would it be a little bit do at your own risk, wouldn't it? Yeah, it is, and I think when um, I think there's a little bit of you know common sense in here around if if it's a, a situation of the the tenant clearly you know not wanting to pay its rent or not being able to pay its rent for non coronavirus related um, reasons, then that's different to a genuine situation. Um, but look, it, it is, um, it's not without risk, unfortunately. Okay. Rebecca, it's quite common to have a self-managed super fund that owns the premises um, that are occupied by a related party. And obviously the self-managed super fund rules require that to be on arm's length commercial basis. I think there's been some announcements, hasn't there, around whether how, how the, the rents might work in, in that situation? Uh, yeah, you're right, John. So um, on a commercial basis, generally, a self-managed super fund can rent its own commercial property to a, an associated company. So that business um, will have probably the same directors and shareholders that are the members of the self-managed super fund. There's very strict rules around that relationship normally, and rent always must be commercial, must be paid on time, and you can't seem to effectively be giving yourself any favours. However, at the moment, if the business that's renting that premises itself is suffering um, a downturn or it's anything similar to businesses at the moment, it can negotiate the same sort of drop in rent and the self-managed super fund will not have an issue at this stage so long as it's reasonable and you have the right documentation and can justify it under what's called the um, non-arms length rules. So, so I suppose we still have to make sure it's on a commercial basis and we're not trying to give ourselves a bit of an advantage on we the other side. If have a 10% reduction in income and then waive rent completely for the next nine months, there could be an issue with that. But if it's yeah. reasonable and applied uh, with the same principles under the code, then that super fund won't have an issue. Um, and uh, again, I would just talk to the person, the accountant that's working with you on your self-managed super fund and make sure that it all smells right and that we get the right documentation in place is and always key for this. Have you even talked to a commercial real estate agent to get a view on, on similar properties, what sort of discounts they've been getting and, and those types of things? Absolutely. With those sorts of arrangements, it's always best to really do your homework well. One of the, one of the questions that's come up in a number of these webinars is around 
even if we do defer some of these things or we have some, um, I suppose, some, some, some arrangements that we enter into at these points in time, do we think there could potentially be any impact longer term on our credit history or, or credit ratings and, and those types of things? Do either of you have a view on that? Um, well, look, the, the issue here is that um, you know, whilst landlords are not allowed to kick tenants out during this period for non-payment of rent, um, it doesn't mean that the landlords still can't be um, you know, suing tenants for, you know, and that's the example I used around this 30% of the rent still needs to be paid. If the tenant doesn't pay it, um, then um, aside from potentially losing the protection under here, the landlord might still be able to sue the tenant. And then if the landlord gets a judgment, then that judgment's going to show up on the credit history. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think pragmatically that um, it might be that, you know, in a few years time, everyone looks back and goes, oh yeah, I had a default, but that was coronavirus. Or there might be, people might be more forgiving, but I, but I do think that if, um, you know, there's still probably quite a risk that, um, tenants who don't pay their rent or something like that um, may get um, you know, adverse reports on their credit rating. Bit of a mark on their, on their history. Rebecca, do you have a view? Yeah, yeah look, I, I probably have a very similar view to Rob, but in a few years from now, everyone's going to look back and be like, what happened in 2020? <laughs> and it's right. share market, GDP, everything. Everyone's just going to blame it all on coronavirus. Coronavirus, no you know, those businesses that were maybe not doing so great in the lead up to this, coronavirus. It'll just explain it all. <laughs> Rhonda's got a question here. Do deferments need to be reflected in a Form 13 amendment covering the new rental and the extended lease date? Um, well, a deferment, a uh, deferral, I don't think would need to be formalised in that. Um, but if you do actually, if the lease is registered and the lease parties have agreed to extend it, then you would do a form 13 to collect that. Okay, good. Um, just if anyone does have any more questions, just quickly throw them on the Q&A now as we, as we start to wrap up. Got any more questions on there, Rebecca, for Rob to answer? We've got another question here around um, outgoing. So whether or not the outgoings will be subject to the reduction in rent or the rent waiver, and if that gets included. I'm going to guess that's going to be around the way that it's dealt with in the lease agreement. Yeah, so yeah, we touched on it before a bit. It's um, like for a gross lease that includes outgoings, it's, it's a little bit problematic because the code doesn't really deal with that. Um, but um, typically in, in that sort of a lease, there's often you know, the, the gross lease is set for the first year of the term. And then each year after you might pay an increase on outgoings or something. So I anticipate that all outgoings components should just remain payable as per normal, um, except for where there's a concession um, that a landlord has to pass on from a government like, entity. Yeah. But I, I wonder if um, that will, uh, well, and that should become more specific when it's legislated, but there might be some movement on that front. Yeah, okay. Davina's asked again, just to reinforce the answer to this one, if you strike a deal now with your tenant, then legislation that makes the agreement different, what happens? I think your advice before Rob was that probably don't strike too longer term a deal, um, just buy yourself some time until legislation gets in. That's right, yeah. And the, it's, just, it's just unfortunate that we don't really know what the timeline's gonna be, whether it's gonna be you know, a week, two weeks, a month, uh, hopefully as soon as possible, you know, we get to see what this legislation looks like. Okay. Um, Good. What else we got on there, Rebecca? Um, we've got a question here around um, if a tenant's had to close completely and they've got zero uh, um, income, can they request to pay zero rent, as in actually request that the whole hundred percent get waived, not a fifty percent waiver and a fifty percent deferral? Well, look, they can ask for it, um, but the the minimum requirement under the code is that the landlord weighs fifty percent of the whatever the um, concession is. So I think a, a you know, tenant by all means ask, um, but um, ask sort of without expectation, I suppose, on that front. And I think if if you were a tenant and you were seeking more than fifty percent as being a waiver, 
then you'd want to be selling the story by, again, that's probably where you then go, maybe I do need to disclose a lot of financial information to show that I really am doing it tough. Um, so I think landlords who get requests for higher than 50% waivers where tenants are not being open and transparent on financials, um, tenants should probably expect to get some pushback on that. Yeah, look, I think that makes sense if they're requesting an aggressive reduction in rent or something yeah. beyond the code, that then there is a higher level of disclosure. Is there um, a, a set period of time for the waiver of rent or is that part of the negotiation process? Well, there is, it talks about a minimum, allowing a minimum period of 24 months after the pandemic finishes to repay that rent. So it, it really talks about if, you, if you'd waived, you know, $100,000, sorry, deferred $100,000 of rent, then that gets amortised over a 24-month period. So it's just divided sort of equally over that period. Um, so the parties are free to agree to a shorter or longer, but that's sort of the base parameter is 24 months. And that's when it gets a bit tricky, as we talked about, what if there isn't enough time left in the lease, which is then when it gets a little bit tricky to work out. And with the, defer uh, with the actual waived part of the rent, is there a minimum period of time that the landlord should be agreeing to per the code or is that also up for negotiation? Well, it's just linked to, I suppose, how long the, it's tied to the period in which the tenant is actually, its turnover has been affected by more than the 30%. So um, what I'd be advising landlords right now is to not, like unless it's a situation where it's very clear a particular type of tenant is not going to be able to reopen for two, three months, that any arrangements you put in place now on waivers are for a shorter period, um, just so that you can reassess it once we know the full picture of, of what's um, required in the law and what's not. So it, it might be easier or harder depending on the, the nature of the type of um, business the tenant's running. We discussed before um, some of the, the tenants' requirements underneath the code and that they must pay the rent that's agreed to be left over. Um, and if not, it might void the whole arrangement. What happens if a landlord sort of doesn't come to the party on this or won't negotiate or won't abide by the code, particularly once it's legislated? What are the options for a tenant in that circumstance? Well, the code talks about there being a, a mediation process, um, which I think would end up um, with a, a binding ruling effectively. So if a landlord and tenant can't agree for whatever reason, then it gets, uh, either party can flick it off to you know, an independent um, mediator who will then um, try to then reach a resolution on it. So there is, there is a sort of a process there uh, to get an outcome. And I think given, you know, the number of tenancies and so forth that exist mm. all around Australia, I think the government's hoping that in most cases, um, landlords and tenants work it out between themselves. But that, that is the, that is, I suppose, the safety net. Um, is that, It'd be interesting how they legislate that. Yeah, yeah that's right. So, um, yeah. yeah we'll hey, see. guys, we might, start, um, we might start wrapping it up because we're, we're out of time. Um, thank you for everybody for coming along and joining us today. Thank you for all of your questions. I know we haven't been able to get to every single question. Um, so if your question hasn't been answered, I know there's a couple of anonymous ones there that um, we may not have got to. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Either Rob Direct, his contact details are on our website at businessdepot.com.au. A copy of this video will be made available on the blog at businessdepot.com.au as well. We've got all the previously recorded webinars. This is now number six. So they're, they're all saved down for you to look back on um, over time as well. Maybe one parting word of wisdom or word of advice from, from each of you guys, if you don't mind, maybe from that landlord and that, that tenant perspective, what would be that final word of advice you'd give Rob? I think um, just don't rush into long-term commitments right now um, for both landlord and tenant. I think um, if, if there's a need to um, make some changes, then just do them for a shorter period and then, and then just commit to reviewing it then. Good advice. Good advice. What about you, Rebecca? 
I'd say for both parties, bring empathy to the discussion. You don't really fully understand the financial circumstances of the other party involved, whether the tenant or the landlord, and just try to stay calm and be quite considered in your approach towards each other. Um, that way the agreements are going to be hammered out a lot quicker. We won't end up in mediation. Yeah, I think my comment would be along those sort of lines as well, Rebecca, you know, just keep it fair. You know, it's not an opportunity to, to gouge or to try and take advantage of a, of a situation and just have a good open conversation um, between the parties to come with a, a fair conclusion without trying to have a, to have a win because we, we, we want a tenant at the end of this as a landlord and the tenant doesn't want to be moving premises at the other end of this because they'll have enough else going on as well. That's so right. as I said, um, all our COVID information, tips on all the tax and accounting, tips on business things to worry about at the moment, land tax concessions, et cetera, et cetera, are all on one of our um, blogs on the website. Um, the shortened URL for that blog is bit.ly, so bit.ly forward slash BD COVID updates. That'll take you to the main blog, which we're continually updating as more information that comes out, um, which seems to be on a daily basis at the moment. Um, don't forget, there's lots you can do in business during these times, even if you are working remotely. Um, I know a lot of people in business don't get the time to get the free headspace to do some of these things that they always want to do. So take the opportunity. We can still deliver services. You can still do a will remotely. You can still do a shareholders agreement remotely. We can still talk business planning and strategy remotely as well. So don't hesitate to reach out to any of us if there's anything we can help you with in that regard as well, rather than just this crisis management type stuff. Once again, Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rebecca. Our next Calm COVID Convo is going to be on investing during these COVID times. Um, and some of the different things that we're starting to have discussions about. We'll be joined by Simone from our Sydney office as well, who's also a financial planner, um, and some of the different considerations that are going on um, from an investing perspective. Good to see the stock market go back up a bit yesterday. Um, so thank you for joining us. And once again, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Rebecca. Goodbye. Thank you.